Mark chapter 28. Today's message is called Defying Adversity. Who has not had adversity in their life? Adversity is something coming against us. Adverse, an adverse condition, an adverse circumstance, an adverse situation, an adverse uh, report from the doctor, an adverse bill that comes in, something that goes wrong. Um, I was talking, you know, this, this past week we were having some issues with our air conditioning system. You know, that third system I told you about didn't work at all last year, that third system, and I was been rejoicing the last few weeks. I turned it on, it's working. Well, um, funny thing, I was here yesterday to turn it on, and I was out back where the breakers are. It was running. I thought, oh, man, I thought I turned that off on Thursday night after service. And I came up here, it was off. Now the system runs even when it's off. So that, that's how, that, you know, I'm, I'm rejoicing. Hey, it's working this year. Yeah, it's working. You just can't turn it off. So uh, that's, that's another issue. But a lot of people, I was talking, was it Joey? Air conditioning went out on a car. Uh, Joanne, did you get the air conditioning fixed in your house? Praise the Lord. This last week, the hottest week so far of the year, no AC in her house. Her AC decides to go on the fritz. There's adversity in our lives. Jesus went through adversity. And not only did he come to speak the word of God, show us the word of God, but to demonstrate the word of God because he is the word of God. And he wanted us to learn not only from his message and his teaching, but from his life. How did he go through adversity? I think of the time that the apostles were sent across the sea, right? He sends them across. He says, you go across, I'll join you later. There's an adverse wind. The wind is coming against them, waves, wind. Now, when you go to Israel, you look at the Sea of Galilee, and you can see the other side. You know, it's not like the ocean. And you wonder, how could that happen? But I've seen that. When a wind comes from the east, and there's a break in the hills just to the east, and the wind comes whipping through there. It was, uh, I think it was in April. And the waves got to be eight, eight, ten feet high. They were coming up over the land, on the land. There were cafes along the Sea of Galilee. They had to move all the tables away because the waves were coming up and coming in and onto the land. And it, it can be in a small boat. If you, we, we take you to see a boat from the time of Jesus that was discovered about 15, 20 years ago. And um, you can see that a small, shallow boat like that can get swamped easily. So the apostles are going across into the adverse wind. Jesus sent them across the adverse wind coming at them. And what are they doing? They're bailing. They're rowing. The word of God in King James says they're toiling. They are toiling. Isn't this what we usually do when we come to adversity? We toil in our own strength trying to get through. We can power through this. We can make it through this. We begin to worry about it. We begin to have some sleepless nights maybe. Other times we come up with a plan how we're going to power through this, how we're going to get through this difficult time. We maybe, if it's financial, we cut our budget, we spend less, we start shopping for less, we don't go out to eat, we don't do amusements because we're going to power through this, but it's in our own strength. They were used to this. They were bailing, they were rowing, they knew how to get through it. Jesus, on the other hand, is in the spirit. He's in God's strength. He's not there bailing or rowing. He's walking in the spirit, walking through the same storm that's about to put the boat down. He's walking. So he knew something that they didn't know about facing adversity. He knew something about depending on the power of God and the strength of the Lord rather than our own strength. Think about the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is about to go through some severe adversity. The apostles are a little bit unaware of it. So what are the apostles doing? First of all, they're sleeping. That's another thing we tend to do when we're facing adversity. Get depressed. When people are depressed, they sleep more. They want to shut, shut it out. Or, not you, but others maybe turn to drugs to shut it out. That's like sleeping. There are many ways people cope. Some cope with a bottle. Some cope with a pill. Some po cope with smoking, whether it's tobacco or marijuana, whatever it may be. But people have various worldly ways of coping. And those, e equate, e those kind of equate to sleeping. Because when you're high, you're not aware of what's going on. You're sleeping through it, even though you're awake. So they slept. And then when the, the arrest comes, what's Peter do? Pulls out a sword. So... Another way that they were going to cope was by fighting. Sometimes when we are stressed out because of adversity, we get belligerent. We want to fight. We got obnoxious. We start picking on people. 
or we're lashing out, usually the ones closest to us. And that's not a way to cope with adversity. It's not that person that's being adverse. It doesn't mean people aren't adverse to us. But fighting is not going to cure anything. It's not going to help anything. A lot of people are turning to fighting far too much now. You know, on college campuses, over free speech, and stadiums, and all around. People are, people are just really quick. Road rage. And then the third thing they did when, when the arrest came is they ran away. And that's the thing that other people do is they run. Fight or flight, they run. Try to run from the problem. Try to run from the issue. You and I probably all know people who have run from marriages to another marriage and then run from that marriage. Because the problem is you can run from a spouse, but you can't run from yourself. And you carry your problems with you. So no matter how far you run or how fast you run, you still have the problems. So running is not going to, to help the adversity. It's not going to cure or stop the adversity. Now, how did Jesus do it? What did Jesus do? He prayed. First of all, before he walked on the sea, he was praying. And then in the garden, before he went to the cross, he was praying. So praying is going to be a key. How we pray, though, is all important. So that brings us to Mark. Mark chapter 28. I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 26. And he said, So is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground. He should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knows not how. For the earth brings forth fruit of herself. First the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest is come. There's our answer. Jesus tells us right there that it's not going to happen instantly. As much as we want the adversity to cease and desist, it may not happen on our timetable. And it may not happen instantly. He talks about a seed. And the first thing that happens when that seed starts coming up out of the ground, you've probably planted seeds, little tiny seeds, and as that sprout, the blade, first the blade, as that blade, as that sprout comes up, have you ever seen a plant lift a big clod of dirt? Lifts it off the ground. It's much heavier than the plant, much bigger than the plant. But somehow that little sprout lifts that heavy object off the ground. That's our first principle. The first thing we see is that if we want to remove the adversity or move the adversity, Jesus said you will move a mountain. So that little sprout, that clod of earth is like a mountain. And it's moving it. But it's moving it imperceptibly. You don't see the clod lifting. You see the result after it's up. The growth is so slow that you cannot observe it unless you have a time-lapse photography. Then you can see it happening. There's movement, but we don't perceive the movement. There's growth, but we don't perceive the growth. There's a lifting, but we don't see it lifting. And it all begins in the darkness. Before it even gets to the surface of the earth, the germination takes place in darkness. The adversity begins to be removed before we are aware of it, when we're praying. When we are praying and we see no movement, we see nothing changing. In reality, in the unseen realm, it's already moving. When we are praying, prayer before dealing with the adversity, prayer before acting, praying. Praying about that circumstance. What do we pray? It depends what the circumstance is. We find the scripture that deals with the circumstance and we begin to pray the scripture. We begin to pray the word of God. Pray it out loud. In the unseen realm, you're not going to see it happen just yet. It's in the darkness and it's slow. That's that first the blade, slow progress. It's slow, but it's progress. The important thing to remember is it's progress. You are progressing and growing. Slow, progressive growth. This is how faith works. 
slow, progressive growth. Now, yes, sometimes there are instant miracles. Sometimes there's instant answers to prayer, but not always. And that means that if we do not receive an instant answer to prayer, it does not mean that God is not answering that prayer. We could be experiencing the slow, progressive growth. First the blade, he said. He's very clear. He didn't say, plant the seed, next day the harvest. He said, first the blade. Know that when you're praying, even before seeing with your, your mind, with your eyes, I mean, you see it in your heart. You see the answer. You see it taking place. Now, for this first blade, you've got to have the word. As I mentioned, you need to pray. So that means we need to put the word in our heart. And the best way that I know to put the word in our heart, M&M's. M&M's work every time. Not the, not the candy ones. Memorize and meditate. Memorize and meditate. I will hide thy word in my heart, lest I sin against you. He watches over his word to protect it. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word will change everything. God's word is alive, sharper than a two-edged sword. We memorize the Word of God. Every week we put a memory scripture in the bulletin. Every week. Left hand, bottom corner, in case you've never seen it. You memorize that through the week. Then we're all memorizing the same Word. The Word always has something to do with whatever, whatever the message is that week. Memorize that. Usually it's short enough to memorize very quickly. Hide that in your heart. Memorize it. Because the Spirit of God will bring that Word up to you when you need it. You're in a situation, a circumstance, and whatever's on the inside, remember out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, well, you want God's word to be coming out. You don't want a curse word to be coming out. You don't want failure, inability. You don't want any of that coming out. You want God's word, positive, powerful word of God coming out of your mouth. So memorize and then meditate. Right? When Joshua had to take over for Moses, what did the Lord tell him? You shall meditate in the book of the law. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Meditate. Say it over and over. Nor from before your eyes. But you shall meditate in this day and night. And then shall you make your way prosperous. And then shall you have good success. Meditating in the word of God means not only are you memorizing it, you're saying it to yourself. You're saying it on the inside. We're not talking about transcendental meditation. You're not talking about yogic meditation. We're not talking about anything where you're saying a mantra. We're talking about the Word of God. Yeah. Meditating in the Word of God means you put it on the inside. You think about it. You roll it around on the inside. You say it. You say it inside. You say it outside. You say it out loud. You say it to yourself. You say it. You say it. You say it. And God will give you revelation. And it will lock it in your heart so that when you need it, it comes out. So the first, the first blade, hide the word of God in your heart. M&Ms, memorize and meditate in the word of God daily, regularly. And you can take the same scripture. Now, you, you probably have some scriptures for things you're dealing with. Tacked up on your bathroom mirror every morning when you get up, you see them and you say them out loud to yourself. Remember when 13, 13 and a half years ago, when I was in the hospital with cancer and the surgeon said you have a very serious very advanced stage of cancer that we cannot remove what did God say he spoke it to me the same night I've had I had the symptoms for a year but that night when the doctor said that he said this you shall live and not die and declare the wonderful works of God for I sent my word and healed you and delivered you from all destruction both from the book of Psalms now what do you think I've been saying every day for 13 and a half years I'm saying those every day I'm speaking those over my body, speaking those, and I'm, I've been cancer-free. Three days after that, the surgeons came in and said, we don't know what happened. We don't know why. This is a head-scratcher, but there's no more cancer in your body. And I walked out of the hospital the next day. Death sentence on Monday, released on Friday. So you don't think I'm saying those every day? I'm saying those every day. Every day, every day. Not out of fear, out of faith. We don't speak God's word out of fear. We speak God's word out of faith. When you get in fear, speak God's word. Remember Jesus walking on the water? 
They were afraid. They thought it was a spirit, a ghost or something. And he said, peace, it's me. Do not fear. Do not let fear into your heart or your mind or your mouth. Hold fast to confession of your faith. He's faithful that promised. But we need to have, a, we need to have something to hold on to. Can you imagine? You're in the water and they throw out a, a life preserver, but it's not attached to a rope. So you're holding on to it, but you're floating away. Hold fast to confession of your faith. He's faithful. He's got the other end of the rope. He's going to pull you in. Number two, the ear. The ear is the unripe fruit, right? First the blade, then the ear. The ear is the unripe fruit. So you see visible change. You have this adversity. The adversity is still there, but you're beginning to see something change. It can still go either way, but something's moving. Something's happening. You're getting a good report suddenly from the doctor. He doesn't say it's gone, but he says, I'm seeing some change. He gives you some hope, a little bit of hope. Or you see something in the finances. Something begins to shift. You're starting to see a little bit more balance in your account. Or something in your family. You're beginning to see a change. There's, there's not that constant edge or, or, or tension. Somebody's heart is changing. Somebody's life is changing. There's a little bit of change. It's the unripe fruit. Don't pick it. Don't pick it. It's not ripe yet. It's only in California that they pick unripe fruit and feed it to us on the East Coast. Anybody here from California? Not, yeah, but you live here now. I mean, anybody currently from California. I don't want to get down on it. If there's somebody here, I don't want to insult you. Well, yeah. Every time I look at fruit in the market, I look. If it's from California, I put it back. I don't want their fruit. They pick it green. They, they put all kinds of gases into it to make it look like it's ripe. I want something that's grown in North Carolina. South Carolina, even Georgia. And Jersey, absolutely Jersey. Let me tell you, I got spoiled being raised in New Jersey as far as, I, now you might say, Jersey? We used to have a billboard in South Jersey. I grew up in South Jersey. We used to have a billboard. It had the whole outline of the state of New Jersey with a line across the middle. The top half is all black. The bottom half all green. And under it said, if it's all asphalt, it's not our fault. <laughs> South Jersey farmers. But I can remember the strawberries in New Jersey. Oh, man. Unbelievable. You pick them and eat them the same day. You know, uh, April is our straw, May in New Jersey. April here. We went, we said, oh, man, strawberry. We saw them picking strawberries in the fields. And other times we've gone out in the fields to pick strawberries. So we went to a local farm. I mean, a local farm here in South Carolina bought this gigantic thing of strawberries because it's right from the farm. They're horrible. I'm thinking, I'm, 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 no, I'm not going to get California. No, California can get them right here. They're terrible. No offense to any South Carolina farmers, but there was no flavor in them. I don't know what happened. In any case, I missed it up. It's all already finished in New Jersey. But blueberry season's coming. Now, June and July, blueberry season up there. Nothing like Jersey blueberries. I know you probably buy yours from Michigan or whatever. North Carolina has good blueberries, too. Nothing like Jersey blues, though, I'll tell you. All right, enough about that fruit. You got me started on fruit. It always, with Italian pastors, it always turns to food. You know, I don't know why, but everything goes to food. Let me tell you one more. Let me tell you one. My, when I was 10, my parents built a house, and it was in an old place that had, it was a blueberry farm. So down at the end of the street, there were still blueberry, blueberry bushes, but nobody farming them because they were building houses. And so for years, we'd go down there, we would pick the blueberries. My mom would make the best blueberry pies. I mean, really good blueberry pies. And then I'm, I'm in high school. Years later, I'm in high school. And our, um, our, uh, you, our high school chemistry professor was also a blueberry farmer. And so he, was tell, he would tell stories. And he was telling us a story about the blueberry harvest and how they would bring all the harvest in. But before they could go to market, you had the state inspectors come and test the blueberries for worms. And he said, it's not that whether it has worms or doesn't have worms. They all have worms, he said. But he said, it's the amount of worms. So there's an acceptable amount of worms. And he said, and, and, and he said now, if you ever see blueberries that are just wild growing, 
He said, they're, oh, they're full of worms. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking of all those years and all those pies. I didn't realize that along with eating blueberries, we're eating mincemeat. Now that I've got you ready for breakfast, unripe fruit. You don't want to pick the unripe fruit. And also, at this point, when the ear is there, that's when the pests come. Most of the pests, they're not going to come when it's when, before the fruit is there. Some of them eat the leaves, but they're, when there's fruit. How many of you, when you buy corn on the cob, it's going to be another, another few weeks, we're going to have our corn season. When you buy corn on the cob, do you just go and you collect them and put them in, or do you open up the top of the ear and check to make sure there's no worms? Right? You open it up. So I was at the market, Myrtle, Myrtle Market, last year, year before. I'm checking them out, and everyone had a worm. I put it back, had a worm, put it back, put a worm, had a put, put. And uh, the farmer sees me doing that, and he comes over to me, just casually, matter of fact, says, you know, if the worms won't eat it, I don't think it's much good for us to eat either. <laughs> now that's putting a positive spin. The man, he must have been a farmer of faith, because that's pretty positive. I, st I still didn't buy any with worms, but anyway. Critters, too. Oh, this is the time. You don't think the squirrels are going to go to those corn stalks before the corn is there? But once the corn is there, man, they are going to be all over that cornfield. You've got to watch out for the squirrels. And Have you ever grown corn at home and the squirrels or tomatoes? My, I don't know. We have Italian squirrels. They love tomatoes. When we grow tomatoes in the garden, they love the tomatoes. And um, this is the time, though, that you need to allow your faith to ripen. This is when the ear, it seems like something's changing, but it's not fully changed. You need to let it ripen. Let the full miracle develop. Don't rush it. What should you be doing at this time? Speaking the word of God. You've done praying. You've already prayed. You prayed before you got to this place, and it sprang up. It moved things. Things are happening. Things are changing. It's growing. Your faith is growing. Your, your answer to prayer is growing. You see the fruit, but it's not ready yet. It's not finished. Be speaking the word of God. The same things you prayed, speak over your harvest. Speak it over. Speak it out loud. Speak it in Jesus' name. Speak it in joy. Speak it in faith. Continue to hold fast to confession of your faith. Speak that word. Speak that word. Speak it to the finances. Speak it to your body. Speak it to your family. Speak it in prayer. When you pray each day, speak it. When you're not praying, continue to hold fast. Then he says the full corn in the, how's he put it? The full corn in the ear. So that means full fruit. That is when the miracle takes place. That is when the answer to prayer. That's the outcome. That's the harvest. That's when you bring it in. That's when you rejoice. That's when you have what you've been believing for. That's when the adversity is on the run. You've resisted the enemy and he's running from you. You've resisted him in Jesus' name and he is on the way out the door. You have the victory. You see the victory. You know you're the head and not the tail. You know you've made it through. You're still on the rock. You have walked on the water. You have believed God and God has answered that prayer. You are seeing your family change, your body change, your finance change, your job change. Everything is changing and for the better because of the power of your prayer, the power of God's name, the power of God's word. So what are you doing now? You're acting on the word of God. You're walking in faith. You're ensuring the victory. Once the fruit's in the, in the field, you've got to go pick it. And you know, whenever there's harvest, there's joy. They don't go slumping through the harvest field. I oh, got to pick some wheat, got to pick some corn, got to pick some. They had harvest songs. And they would sing and rejoice because this was life. The harvest meant life. The harvest brings joy. When you're harvesting the answer to your prayer, don't be saying, well, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. No, you're not waiting for the other shoe to drop. Well, you know, with every good thing comes something bad. No, unless you're expecting and believing for that. When God blesses, he blesses. And when he blesses, he blesses all the way. When Jesus rose from the dead, he rose for every single one of us. He rose in power. He didn't leave part of him behind. When he paid the price, he didn't pay for a few. He paid for everyone. 
He doesn't do things halfway, partway, partial. You don't get a partial healing. If you get your partial healing, believe for the rest of it. The one man who was blind, he could see men as trees. Jesus prayed again, he got it all. Get it all with God. Get it all with God. Don't get halfway. Don't go halfway. Don't believe halfway. Don't expect half. Expect it all. We're not half-baked. We have it all in Jesus. We have it all. Trust God. When you're saved, you're not partially saved. You're not almost saved. You're not half saved. Nobody's almost saved. Either you're saved or you're not. Either you're forgiven or you're not. Either you're washed by the blood or you're not. Either the old man is dead or he's still kicking. 